Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby pod. Lots going on in New Zealand rugby at the moment with the Women's World Cup, which of course will delve into who's playing well, the playing style. Maybe an interesting comparison between the way it's played in the men's game and played in the women's game and the differences we've seen over the weekend. We've also had the All Blacks 15, which some people are joking and calling the Crusaders development side as well picked this weekend. We'll get to the bottom of, of what that team's all about, especially for the international audience who don't really understand what an All Blacks 15 is and how that differentiates them from the All Blacks. So joining me now, James Parsons in Auckland. It's going to be a lot of fun. And over in Japan, former Crusader, current Japanese professional, <laughs> Bryn Hall. How are you? <laughs> Good, mate. Good, mate. There's a lot of Crusader boys in there, isn't there, Ross? There is. <laughs> there are a lot of Crusaders within that side. Uh, it, it's quite an interesting team, the All Blacks 15, for that reason, isn't it? Like, what is the point of this team? It, it's, a, it's kind of going two ways, development and helping keep fringe players? Yeah, I definitely think there's elements of the selection that is guys that are in consideration still for the World Cup. And then there's an there's a element of looking to the next four-year cycle and, and giving that opportunity and also to see where they're at if they're, if they're ready for that next step. So I think it is a well-balanced side. There's definitely some unlucky players that are in awesome form that probably would be the next cab off the rank. But, um, you know, you've got to understand it from a coach's point of view and, um, you know, making sure that they hit the ground running of the next four-year cycle to build to the next World Cup as well. And it is selected by the All Blacks selectors. Yeah. So, you know, that, it, it's an interesting statement as to what's going on. I think two of the most interesting points. Peter Gus Salkula, Bryn. It wasn't long ago he was one of the form players of Super Rugby. He made his test debut. He scored a try under the posts. Everything seemed great. And now he can't even make the B team, the B squad. Mm. Why? Well, it's a really good, really good question, Ross, because, uh, look, he's come back for Taranaki and he's actually played you know, some pretty good footy as well. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for the guys of like Moreno, who they haven't seen, and even the likes of Zach Gallagher, who can cover six. And whether he's seen it, it's just a locker, I'm not too sure. But And you've got Luke Jacobson, who's come back. But, yeah, it's tough for Peter Gus. You know, not too long ago, he was playing in that Irish test, got two test matches in. Um, yeah, it's obviously on the outer right now. So um, you're really tough. And even you look at guys like, you know, Sean Stevenson as well, who – who had a great North Harbour set, played great for North Harbour, has played well in the Maldives and, and misses out. But I guess, you know, um, these are these other guys that have played well, like AJ Lamb and Ruben Love, um, who have been selected. So, um, you know, Peter Gus is a big admission, I think, for me. You know, a guy that was in the All Black squad, had a great Super Rugby and has played pretty well in Mighty 10 Cup as well. So, um, I don't know, maybe we might have to get our journalist's boots on and ask why uh, Peter Gus has been missing. I think it's a little bit... Um like a change in coach, the reality is is the, the selection group for Ireland and, the, and then obviously into the rugby championship was different. Um, but it, it surprised me on the, um, if I use Samasoni Tokiaho as an example, like the impact he's having with carrying, getting that front football, like Peter Gus is a big body and he, he, that's his point of difference is he, he is so strong in the carry. Um, so. I'm sure he's getting some feedback and what they need to see, and, and you certainly can't count him out. But um, you know, it, it, it is a, he is a surprising admission. Mm. And you mentioned the change of coach, and well, there are a lot from a former Canterbury forward coach, <laughs> former Crusaders forward coach. We look at Finlay Brewis, to Mighty Williams, George Bell, Zach Gallagher, Dominic Gardner. These are all guys under 22. They're essentially Crusaders development players, and here they are on this trip. I think, like, not to regurgitate a story that's been told a thousand times, but Eric Rush, um, and when he first made the All Blacks, um, you know, he he was told by his dad, you know, didn't over celebrate. It's only one man's opinion. And then when he dropped out of the All Blacks, and he was obviously down, and he goes, it's only one man's opinion. So, uh, when when there is a change of coach. You, they, they know what their strength is and the type of player they need to get the best out of their, what they're expecting of their players. Um, and you can't knock that. Um, and, and obviously the depth and knowledge of those individuals is a lot greater than potentially others around in the NPC that, that are performing. You know, especially if, if you also look at a guy like Kurt Eklund, um, played extremely well um, for, for Ireland, uh, against Ireland for the, for the Maldives and, and you know, doing a great job leading Bay of Plenty to a semi-final. Um, you know, he, you have to consider him unlucky as well. Mm, mm. Brendan, the other interesting one there is Levi Almour. You know, um, Moana Pacifica, 
um, former Crusaders player, but Moana Pacifica, he... Well, it's, it's an odd decision because there's so much midfield depth, you'd expect that he'd want to play for a Samoan team that is building lots of good depth using overseas professionals that hadn't been available, and he could fit into that quite well, and here he is. Well, I think the good thing about this All Blacks 15 is that it, you don't get you don't get caught as a as an international cap, you know what I mean. So you know he must have aspirations to to want to be an All Black, and whether he's had words, he obviously has had words um, from the coaches to be able to say, you know, not don't give up on the dream of being an All Black. So um, I guess what he does do, he's something different. You know, he's a guy that um, brings something different to all the other midfielders that we have at the moment. We've talked around you know, Geordie and how well he played, been able to get the ability over the advantage line. And look, Levi Moore, whether it be at Mighty 10 Cup, uh, Bunnings NPC, or even this year with Moana Pacifica, his ability to be able to beat, to beat the tackle one-on-one, or even two, two, three defenders is one of his great strengths. And so, you know, it's a win-win for the All Blacks. You know, they get him into their All Black environment. He gets to play two test matches against the Barbars and against Ireland A. Eh? And if he plays well in that test match, it's... It's a win-win for those selectors thinking like, yep, we might be able to bring him up to the next level if there are injuries or um, even next year they play as well for Mono Pacifica. Um, but again, it still opens the door for him to be able to play for Samoa or Fiji with him not being able to get um, you know, inter- international cap to stop him to be able to play with those island nations even in, even in the World Cup and, and in the future. I liken him to Nani Lamapi. Uh, you know, like he, he mm-hmm. has the ability to play 12-13, potentially could even play on the wing. He's fast enough. Um, and from my understanding, Levi made it very clear that he wanted to be up for selection for this team, um, and obviously the the All Blacks as well. So he's obviously motivated by that. He's performing extremely well. Played, you know, was Player of the Year for Moana Pacifica, um, and would have gone close, um, you know, down at the Mako. But his centre mate as well, Nankerville, It's actually a really good reward for him. Um, and the work he's done over a number of years um, you know, in that midfield, but also has that versatility to play wing as well as we saw for the Chiefs this year. So it's actually exciting for both those men um, and, and what their future may hold. Still very young, um, but got a lot of runs on the board. Sorry, I was just going to say as well, Ross, I think, um, you know, a guy like Bryce Hayne, you know, on the, on the other way as well, you know, obviously gone away overseas and then Players trade for the Blues coming back and, and playing well for NPC with Auckland. Um, he's a great guy. I think it's a great reward as well. He's had been around a little bit, hasn't gone through the traditional route of staying in New Zealand and you know even the, the development of these young guys we talked about with the Crusader boys. Um, it's great for a guy like Bryce him to get an opportunity to play at this level because um, seasons, experience, been around the world, and a great story for a guy like that to make that side as well. I think also the impact that he had Bryn on the Blues. Yeah. Um, you know, he he was a yeah. really massive leader in that environment and he brought the best out of a lot of people so I think they saw that not only in the people around him at the Blues but also in his individual performances and what he can do and again I hate to say it but versatility mm. he can play midfield and mm. he can play on the wing potentially could play at fullback as well but more than likely he's there to help lead and guide well he'll be a big factor of um, that you know obviously Paddy's there um, you know Bryce you've got Damien you've, you've got a a big bulk of experience. I even chuck a Safa more in that camp. Like he's sh- shining as a leader. Um, you know, you talk about someone unlucky as well as probably his captain Duplessy Karifi, but he's he, he's had a massive season not only in his performance but what he's doing and, and bringing his best out of others. But the selfless nature of his work that he's doing in and around their systems to to obviously not overplay his hand, but when he does get involved in the game, he's making big impacts. Karifi, he was brought into the All Blacks a year or so ago. This time round, they've gone with Billy Harmon. Again, I, I hate to say it, but you know, obviously Plumtree was there and he liked um, Duplessy. And again, it's a player he has a lot of knowledge of and a lot of depth to it. Um, and, and it's no different for Jace Ryan and, and Billy Harmon. And, and I don't. It's really hard to compare the two because both of them have had outstanding NPCs. Like Billy Harmon's been massive. Um, you know, and I not wanting to bring it up, obviously Bryn was a big fan of Canterbury winning at home. Not as easy as you thought, me old mate. Um, but Billy Harmon was massive in getting some key turnovers when Northland were running hot at the end of that first half, and he did it towards the end to give them the opportunity to win that game. Mm, mm. Um, real kind of interesting points in here as well, I think. Obviously, your old mate Bryn Gatland, he's oh, there. Mate, I was so um, pumped for that. Do you start him or Damien mm. McKenzie at 10? How do you approach this? You give him a game each? Potentially um, start Gats and Damien at 15, bring Damien up to first five and bring a guy like Ruben Love in, potentially. Um, But you've also got the ability to start um, Damien and have Ruben Love. So it may look different for both games. There's two 
two games, but you'd have to think on form at 10, um, you know, Bryn, Bryn was a key reason that, you know, Harbour couldn't bring it home against Auckland. Yep. Um, so I, I think, you know, he's probably the most informed 10. Um, and Damien's versatility early in the game, having that time to see where he can attack, um, you know, is, is when he's his biggest weapon. And then when he steps up to that first receiver role, which he does a lot from 15 anyway, but late in the game against tiring bodies, he is, he is just so, um, you know, dangerous um, throughout that full 80. I just think it's his better fit of going from 15 to 10. What would you do, Brent? Yeah, I think exactly what, what Jip said. And I think, you know, it depend, depending on, you know, Jordy Barrett and what his position is going to be moving forward, we've obviously got Bowden Barrett, who's got that, you know, we've talked about the double pivot role, but uh, he plays it pretty well anyway, just as a fullback. But, you know, Damo can do that position as well. He can do that, play at 10, play at 15. So, you know, having the ability to play 15, whether that be Bowden, Bowden starts or, you know, the All Black selectors want to see him at 10 and try and go for what Stephen Perifet has been doing. Has that been that third 10 who can cover that 15 role? So, um, but yeah, I think. We haven't seen a lot of Damien McKenzie. I think, you know, we, he's obviously an all-black and uh, people have wanted to see him play this level. So I think, you know, some people would have thought wanted to, wanted to see him in the in the all-black squad when selected. But I think this is a great opportunity for him to play, be able to play 10 or 15. And, um, you know, they could even split it with Bryn starting one and then Damo starting at 10. And like Jip said, you've got Ruben Love who can cover 15 as well. One guy, Bryn, I want to ask you about, mate, is uh, Cam Roygaard. Obviously, I was a big mm. fan throughout the NPC. Um, but a great reward for someone that's delivered um, massively against a team that, well, for a team that's been struggling. Yeah, it was, mate. And I think that's the, the, the best thing about it. You know, sometimes when you're in these top teams, they tend to get a look in a little bit more when you're, when you're playing well and teams are winning. Um, you tend to get the teams to sele get selected that way. But look, he's been outstanding for, for counties. He's been the best player in that competition, to be honest. I um, mean, if he wasn't playing, um, it would have been even, I think, a little bit worse for that county team because of how influential he was. And um, it's going to be great for him. You know, he's been in that Hurricanes environment. He's learned to under TJ a little bit. But, you know, whenever, any time you can get into that All Black environment and be with um, that kind of professional, uh, really professional outfit and being able to learn, prepare and see other guys that are at a high level, um, it's going to be great for his development moving forward. And even, you know, coming into next year, um, we'll be able to push TJ in that um, Hurricanes Hurricane squad because, like you said, Jip, uh, and for you, Ross, a good counties man. Um, it was great to see him to be able to be rewarded for, for such a great season, and um, good to see that you do get rewarded at Mighty Ten Cup or Bunnings NPC. It doesn't matter what team you play for. So many good counties players across those squads now. Oh, there is. There is. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be able to keep them all? Is the question. <laughs> oh, we poach most of them. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Never mind keeping them. Um, the RTS factor as well. Like, there's a couple of things I think in the All Black squad where people thought maybe they could have been used in the All Blacks 15. Um, Stephen Petafetta and RTS. You know. They could get a lot of game time in these two games, or they could get minimal game time on an All Black tour. Uh, you know, I, I think there's the potential to go between the squads. I think they're both up there, and there's if you know they've got to be there as injury cover or starters um, throughout the the tour for the All Blacks first and foremost. But if the squad's going well and um, you know building towards that England test, and they're not getting as many minutes, I, I think. It wouldn't be a foreign concept for, for a number of All Blacks um, if it works for, you know, again, the coaches the, uh, the coaches that selected it will have an idea, potentially, of, um, and that's where they might have gone for a little bit more youth because there could be some opportunity of, of dropping guys down. Um, but, you know, you'll never know until, until the tour gets underway. But I don't think it would be a foreign concept to, to see some of the All Blacks play for this side. So what's the goal? Obviously, there's the personal goals and there's the development side of it. But this is a rugby team that's going to play rugby teams and has to win. Mm. So from you know a standpoint where you're only playing a couple of games a year and you're almost like a Barbarians team coming together for a couple of weeks, how do you go about making this a success from a team point of view, Bryn? Well, I think we've seen, seen it before with the New Zealand Maldives. Um, very similar. You only come together um, you know, one or two weeks and the preparation side's really, really small. And so... Um, but again, whenever you put an All Blacks jersey or a New Zealand Māori jersey on and play for your country, um, it has incentive for you to play well. And no doubt, you know, Leon, Scott Hansen and the All Black selectors as well will be obviously driving that, driving home that point around, um, you know, this is an All Black 15. And the players will know as well that the expectation is to win and, and knowing what it 
it means to be in the All Black 15. So um, the preparation side will just be probably a lean menu, very small menu, and being able to, I guess, use the talents of all the guys that they have there and being able to just go out there and play instinctively. So um, I know Liam McDonald's very attention to detail and, you know, with some really good game plans along with Scott Hansen. Um, but again, um, there's been a blueprints of how you can do with New Zealand Māori and even teams in the future the junior, uh, in the in the past with the with the junior All Blacks as well. I think Clayton McMillan's a great coach for the forwards as well. Like he'll keep it simple, and um, I think he's had that great experience, like Bryn says, around the New Zealand Māori. So he's got a really good sort of game plan or um, you know knowledge of how to bring the best out of squads because he's been so successful mm. as the New Zealand Māori coach. So I think he's a key asset, um, and and it's great to see him progressing, you know, what he's done for the Chiefs and, um, you know, brought them through. And then with the New Zealand Māori, it's, it's, it's also good for the coaches to know. And it's good for us to retain those sorts of coaches, mm. you know, that, that we need in this country to develop our super players to become next All Blacks. And it's also a stepping stone for them. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the third level of players as well. Because if you see that you're not in the top 70 players in the country, there's a chance you're going to be going... Like, for instance, the rumours around Sean Stevenson yeah. going to the NRL. You, Sean Stevenson right now will be going, hmm. Potentially, yeah. Like, there's no, let's make no bones about it. Um, an opportunity to go play for the Dolphins um, under Wayne, Brennett, Wayne Bennett would be enticing. I don't know if it's rumours or true, um, but it is really hard. Um, especially back three is always tough, and, and probably Damien's versatility um, doesn't help Sean. Um, but based on his form... I expect I expected to see him in this team, um, but again, sometimes need to take that <laughs> patch off. So, um, but like his, he he's he's been one of the form players in, in the NPC, and I, I know Sean wears his heart on the sleeve, and he'll be he'll be gutted. Yeah. Um, but so, like like many would be, um, it's uh, and that's what I mean when players are aspirational and you don't achieve it. You you've you've got to have that hurt. If you don't have that hurt, then why are you actually turning up? Because yeah. these are the teams you want to make. One of the greatest heart on your sleeves moments I think I've ever seen in rugby was on the weekend at Eden Park. When they were lined up for the anthems and you could see the smiles on the players' faces, the New Zealand and Australian players, that is, before that game was amazing. They're looking up at a full stand and the smile, like you don't see people smile during the anthems. There's intensity, there's this one, there's, you know, tears, there's a lot... But this overjoyed nature of it was quite incredible, Bryn, just to, to feel the importance of it and how they couldn't help but just be in the moment. Well, it just shows, doesn't it? Um, you know, when, you, when people are given opportunities, um, it shows how much they care about it. And, you know, the New Zealand women um, have been talking about this a long time. They're wanting to you know, have, make their own kind of groundbreaking stories and, and, and I guess, um, and players have been able to um, have the opportunity to play in those kind of um, games because, look, it was great for the public to come out and uh, you could see, like you said, Ross, um, the smiles and I guess the, the opportunity to have, be able to play in front of that many people and it probably, no doubt, we'll, we'll go into a little bit a little bit more, um, you know, probably was the pressure of being able to play in front of people and the expectation of being at home and the Black Fiends probably struggled a little bit in the early doors of that game. But again, um, you know, this is probably going to, hopefully, this is a, um, an opportunity for this to be able to happen a lot more because... Um, I guess those girls, no different from us players, when you're playing games like that, there's a lot of people watching, there's a lot of hype around it. It just adds to the entertainment of being able to go out and play for your country as well. So um, no doubt we'll go into a little more about it, but great to see those pitches and see those girls passionate around uh, playing at a full um, full stadium at Eden Park. I, I think it just resembled, they are almost two different games. Yes, it's the same game of rugby, but it's played in different styles. The emotion of certain things like the anthem and the haka is, is just taken differently um, and, and it's given a, a quite a, a neat perspective on on you know how different it is I suppose you know even if you look at throughout the game um, you know lack of kicks in play you know they were picking and going from 60 out but you know earned penalties and uh, there's just a there is quite a big difference in, in, in the styles and, and I think that's a good thing. Mm, the, the ball in hand aspect of it is amazing like it is literally in hand the entire time, and you know, we complain about in the men's game that there's not enough play. Yeah, well, you the know, ball in the women's game. The ball and play was huge, and and you know, sometimes when you look at the stats, like I was just thinking, what would you know Wayne Smith be thinking? And, and probably the handling errors were quite high. I think it was 11 to one um, in the first half, and and that's quite high in the sense that 
Aussies had 65% of the ball in territory, so, and then they only had one turnover, and we obviously had 11. So we had chance in our arms, and and you know going after it, but it is a, a risk versus reward. So I think early on the test they'll want to shore that out because you wouldn't want to give that many opportunities to an England side, especially being able to go kick for the corner because when the Australian attackers got between two defenders, it just made that ruck a little bit deeper and then that's when the advantages came and that penalties just snowboard, snowboard and, and obviously Aussie took re you know, reward of it but they probably should have scored more points. Um, and, and I think we saw the value of um, the seven stars, uh, particularly um, Flula and Tui and Flula and Woodman. You watch them defensively. They've, they're always in sevens. You're in compromising positions defensively. So their ability to read that and make great decisions and use the sideline as their friend was, was awesome. But also when they didn't need to use their sideline as a friend, they were up and closing space. And I thought that was, that was huge. Defensively, they actually did really well to, I know it got to 17 um, nil or 17-7, um, but it could have been a lot worse, and, and a lot of it was that defence on the edge. And the only time they got caught short was the quick tap, and they were probably expecting a kick to the corner um, and an intercept. Um, but other than that, it was a pretty tight defensive effort, um, and they were massive. And in the 24th minute, you saw Sarah Hidani be inside Ruby too, and it's like Ruby just reacted off her, Sarah hit any boom, chop tackle, bang, turnover. So all those sorts of things, there's a, I, I, they'll build nicely, they'll learn a lot from that. Smithy will you know, take a, a deep dive in, in particular at first 40. And I, I think it was a nice scare for them to have now knowing they could come back and win. Mm. And, and now it prepares them with a little bit of a harder edge building into the latter parts of the, of the competition. I think that's the... Um that's the most important thing there, Jip, being able to come back and being able to, you know, what was it, 41 unanswered points that they were able to score from there because, look, you know, playing in a, in a, in a big game in front of a lot of hype, a lot of people and expectation to go out there and perform very, very well um, with Wayne Smith and how they've played the last year, um, they could have fallen into the trap and not come back. And so um, it's great for them to be able to, to be able to show a bit of grit and resilience, to be able to come back, put in some performances and be able to, I guess, rectify from that start. But, yeah, I, I agree with you, Jim. If you can't, uh, we can't be able to give opportunities of unforced errors and being able to give the likes of England, um, who are on the weekend against Fiji, shows. If you don't get it right, they've got the ability to score 10, 11 tries. So I don't think they'll score that much against us, but, you know, we don't want to be giving them opportunities. And so I think it does, um, it's a good start for them and being able to keep them honest. The review, no doubt Wayne Smith will be very good around that and wording it right for the girls. But, um, again, as well, it's hard to play your opposition when you play them a lot. You know, they've played the Australians four times this year, and sometimes, um, you know, the occasion of, you know, being able to, to beat them and never lose to them could have fallen to their plan as well. But I don't think so. I think it's more so the occasion of what Eden Park and the kind of opening and the, the crowd, uh, but it'll set them up very, very well. And, um, you know, England looked good as well, even though the start uh, against Fiji, not as great, but um, came, over, came right over the top with their set piece and how dominant they were in that area in the second half. Bryn, were you surprised by the lack of kicking? I think it was around the sort of 50, yeah. 60 minute mark. Australia, 227 metres to our 28 metres. And those 28 metres were obviously attacking kicks. I, I, I think it almost said to me, like, I was surprised. But then I thought, well, every time Australia's kicked, the mindset is to attack. And, and obviously the Black Ferns scored a number of tries from the you know, kick counter attack. It, it almost because of that ball and play and that mindset that we're all out attack doesn't matter where we are in the field, you wouldn't want to kick, mm. you know. Like, but mm. all teams are looking like every time they just want to attack. Yeah, and I guess that's the that's the good the good thing about the women's game. And I guess watching it, you know, we've talked a lot around how much of a kicking game, whether it be contestables off nine, of ten, kicking down the middle of the field and being able to manipulate because. Defenses are so good, but I guess with the women's game, and especially the, the New Zealanders, um, the Black Ferns, we know that when they play the likes of England, the ability that they have they wanted to get around teams and use their skill set is going to be really important for them. And so, you know, they only had what was it? They only had six kicks on the weekend. You know, so it was a pretty clear plan that they were wanting to run the Australians around and wanting to use their skill set. But you know, just through that's the probably if you don't get it right and you get a lot of unforced errors um, against a team like England, if you do play like that, so don't kick a lot. Um, you might get into a little bit of trouble, but um, 
yeah, I think it, it is different. I think France had 27 kicks who were probably who kicked the most um, during that first round. But, um, you know, more so for the New Zealanders, you'd like to think that there might be a little bit more balance if they, if they don't get it right and there are a lot, lot, there are a lot of unforced errors. How can we still exert pressure and be able to get them in difficult situations defensively? You know, those attacking kicks that we saw with DeMont early on um, against the Australians in the previous test matches before the World Cup have the ability to do that. Hazel Chubik can do the attacking kicks as well and has actually shown um, at uh, Old Picky and with counties that she can kick as well. Uh, because I think they are going to have to have that option, I think, when they do play the likes of France and England. If they aren't getting their attacking structures right with ball in hand and with unforced errors, you've got to be able to um, have a kicking game, which, we can, which we've talked about with the men's level. Yeah, and I think it's it's an attacking kicking game because both those sides want to go to set piece. You know, like I, you you still got to have the kicking game, like you talk about um, um, those players having. But it's almost like long and in, or you're looking to get the ball back uh, because mm -hmm. I think the more often they go to set piece, the more comfortable you know a French and an English side will be. On paper, this weekend, the England versus France game seems like the game of pool play. Yep. Like this is the big one. From what you saw on the weekends, how do you think this one's going to play out? I think England will win. Um, I don't think the French should kick as much as they do. I think they've got such attacking threats, and, and they'll 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 also they'll want to go to set piece. They've probably got a little bit more dominant set piece as well. So I think the French are going to have to find a little bit of French flair um, and and try yeah. and change up what the, what England are expecting, um, but. From what I saw, I think, just like I said with the Black Ferns, that little scare of 40 minutes will bring quite a hard edge to the English preparation, and I think we'll see a much better side that comes out on the weekend. Mm. A few, Bryn? Yeah, I agree. I think the French would love to go to, to set piece as much as they can. Um, you know, we even saw last year pictures of when they played the, the Black Ferns, how dominant they were in their scrum halves, the, 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 two, the two good scrums, scrum halves that they've got and being able to play off that were really good. So, um, But I think, again, I think for, for France, it's going to be the ability to stay on for the whole 80 against this English side because, you know, let's be under no illusions. These girls are, what, 27 or whatever, how many in a row fixtures of winning test matches and playing the Six Nations and playing against them um, pretty consistently. So um, their ability to stay on for 80 minutes and, you know, win moments and just stay in it for as long as they can and, I guess, get to a position where it comes into the last 20 where it's very, very close, and you know that's when you start questioning English skills and saying, you know, can you, can you, can you beat us? Because we're staying with you the whole time. But um, yeah, you'd expect the French to try and win through that set piece and get some dominance there, and then uh, being able to get into the twenty-two, like the South African men, and go to their line-out drive in their, in their scrum as well. The Welsh had a tough um, game on the weekend that probably prepared them quite well for the Black Ferns. Yeah, well, they got ahead quite comfortably, but turned around in the second half and nearly, nearly lost that one. So, and uh, which. It's surprising because Scotland obviously didn't have a victory um, in the Six Nations but uh, and probably didn't come as close as they did so they just buttoned off a little bit um, so they'll they'll want to be they'll want to be better as well and, and I think it's like we've mentioned a lot like a, momentum will change but it's it's about how fast you get that momentum back um, and and I think all the sides on the on the weekend would say it probably took too long in patches to get the momentum back to to their way especially the sides that were expected to win mm -hmm. um, and for the black ferns i suppose it's an interesting question Bryn, is what they do with their selection this time around do you stay the course do you build on the team that played last week or do you look to make a number of changes against wales yeah i think there might be a, a few changes um you'd like to think that they want that um, ability to have the cohesion and I guess build throughout the tournament but yeah I think there will be will be a, a few changes you know I'm not too sure with um, Katatu whether she, her injury or whether that brings Bremer in for an opportunity at six or they um, go in a different direction but um, yeah I think because they haven't played a lot of test matches and you know that they're not the same as the All Blacks where you have full fixture seasons of playing 14, 15 tests um, you know I think Wayne Smith will probably um, you know have a nucleus of the squad that he probably wants to keep together but then again giving girls opportunity and opportunities to be able to take the claim for the for the later parts of, of the tournament. Yeah, I think um, one, the slow start and just wanting to keep a little bit of edge in the group will mean there's a number of changes yeah. um, and it's a it's a long tournament so you just got to keep your powder dry. Um, so I, I think we'll see a, a relatively different side um, from from the previous game. Is the big selection question um, after seeing Ruby Tui have a huge game and Porsche Woodman do what Porsche Woodman does. 
Ayesha Letilinga has probably been the best black fern in the last 12 months. And can she make this side? Look how busy she was when she came on. Like, it, it's, yeah. And, and, and I think that opportunity, you can, all that competition brings the best out of everyone. Um, and, and I think, I just go back to what Wayne Smith said, is he doesn't know his best 23 yet. So even though that was a 23, to me as a player, I'm thinking, man, you've got to dot your I's and cross your T's because it's, you're on a knife edge whether you're going to be in the 23 and the starting 15 um, or, or left out altogether. So I, I think he's still probably using this pool play to, one, assess form, current form, and, and who's going to give them the best opportunity, but also styles, having the ability to change styles and, and take on teams that may have different threats. Mm. You bring that cohesion argument that you were talking about earlier with Stacey Flula and the, the, the Sevens players. Would that be the thing that maybe holds Aisha back? Uh, well, I think... You go, Brian. I think the thing as well is that, like, um, Jip says it a lot, you know, your currency is only as good as, as you're playing, you know? So if you're Ruby 2 and you're Portia Woodman, um, you continue to whatever opportunities you are given, um, you tell Wayne Smith that, you know, I'm playing well and you've got to select me. And so... You know, that'll be no different with um, you know with those girls with those girls and even the girls in general knowing that um, you know if they don't know who their, their starting 23 is or who the best 15 is it gives you incentive in the, in the training weeks and even in training and for the games moving forward that you know what I've got to put my best foot forward, foot forward here because it's an open competition you know, the team isn't made um, and so it gives you an incentive as a player to want to play well train well and when given the opportunity you've just got to take it with both hands mm -hmm. well it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because they are phenomenal players Oh, yes. uh, unbelievable. I do think that cohesion and being able to read each other, like I used that example in the 24th minute of Ruby Tui's turnover, it was just so obviously like they've done that a million times on the seventh circuit. But it's just so, I just thought it was, it just shows the benefit of being comfortable with the un uncomfortable defensively. Like, they're so used to being so uncomfortable in the sevens game because there's so much space that they just looked, they didn't look panicked when there was an overlap or maybe they didn't quite get their connection right. They, they, they knew and they trusted each other that they'd turn up and be there and I just think that's a massive point of difference when you start going into the deeper part of the... And they're used to big stages. At 17 nil down, at no point would have they not felt that and come back in a sevens game. And I know it's different and there's more time, but it's not different in their mindset and the way they'll be thinking. And that is powerful to have in a huddle. And, and the smiles are still there. You look at the turnover, they're, they're 17 7 or whatever it is in the turnover, and the smile, they're, they're just, they, they, they don't think they're losing. Mm. It almost, you don't even look at them and think they're under pressure. Yeah. Um, and I think that is just something that they need to harness, and the more often that can be on the field, um, the better. They've played so many games as sevens players. I suppose that's the thing that you get. There's certain, you know, big matches that you play in sevens that will stand out, but you play so many games and you're put in that situation so mm. often that it's just second nature. Yeah, but also, you, you in sevens, you can get out to a big league and mm. still lose. So, I, I don't know, all those experiences is just so powerful. Um, and, and look, the 15s game will get it more and more and this group will feel it and grow it, but at this current moment, their level of um, big game experience is massive. Mm. Who else impressed you, Bryn? I think actually for, for the Italian team, I enjoyed watching the Italian team, which was a great result for them. And um, I know we always talk about the Black Ferns, but you know, I thought the two wingers, Mozzo and, and Magari, man, they were, um, if the Italians can give them more opportunities to try and um, score tries on the edge because um, with that ball in hand, we've talked around Porsche, Wibbon, Ruben, Tui, um, and their opportunities and being able to score points and when given the opportunities, I thought those two girls um, were outstanding for Italy. So yeah, they were two girls that I thought um, really stood up for an Italian team, which I think is a dark horse, guys. I don't know about you, Jip, but you know, I was pretty impressed with the Italians and getting that win on the weekend. Yeah, well, they didn't have a strong Six Nations either, so they, they, they'll be buoyed by it. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how deep they'll go. In, in terms of, you know, if you look at the ruthless nature of the, the teams like the French, the English, and obviously the Black Ferns, it'll be a big ask. It'll be a big ask. I do want to make mention of the Black Ferns skipper, Rohe Demont. I, I thought she was massive. You, that, that ball she gave inside to Ruby Tui when Ruby, I know it was, it, it's a try assist of such, but Ruby did the freakish of all freakish runs with raw pace, but 
that pressure from that Aussie defender was right up in it, and she just tapped it like that, didn't even catch it. Mm. Um, I, I think she was huge um, in terms of making the most of the platform given up front and, and, and allowing, um, you know, even Duplessis and, and Flula the opportunity with ball in hand to manipulate defence to free up, you know, Tui and, and Woodman. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like for a long time, because Kendra Coxedge has been such a dominant force, that the Black Ferns have played a lot off nine. They've kicked a lot off nine, they've played a lot off nine. I feel like now that that licence is there, Ruahe's confidence has grown that, yeah, I'm, I'm a key playmaker here too. It's not just the halfback. I, I feel like she's got a great feel of when uh, the forwards are going forward and, and Kendra's getting out and sucking in defenders. Sometimes she even reacts off her and promotes herself, but she also has a great feel when she wants the ball quick. Um, and, and I think her times where she lets the forwards and Kendra have their moment uh, and have times that she wants it released, which is probably coming from good comms from, from outside, um, but she's a big part of making sure that, that she orchestrates the, the balance of that attack and, and doing a great job. Yeah. I think what it does as well, um, you know, with the, with Wayne Smith coming in, the, um, even the unforced, there was a lot of unforced errors on the weekend. When they do get it right and you get the, the animation right with the with the forward runners and, you know, we've talked about Richard Moanga and the ability to play out the back or play on the edge. When you get that good go for board, players like DeMont, they can just really influence games, whether it be with the attacking game with running, distribution or kicking and so um, you know hopefully moving forward the um the forward pack of the new zealand team and we'll be able to give them good go forward ball because when you've got duplicy you've got flula who's i thought was um, outstanding on the weekend with her link play running play and defensively like you talked around jip the more times that they can get really good ball and being able to i guess uh, get to the edge and being able to give those girls opportunities um you know it gives the likes of demont uh, great opportunities to be able to do good things in games Another person I'm sure you were impressed with on the weekend was uh, Laura Sansu from France. Did you enjoy watching yeah. her play, Brent, the halfback? Yeah, I did. I think I said it previously last time when I saw them watching that um, India tour, her ability to be able to attack and snipe. Um, we talk about DuPont um, and the French halfbacks and how he's one of the best players in the world. Um, it's great to have that kind of player as well who can, I guess, uh, just really smart as well. They've got a really good knack. I don't know what they do in the French game uh, over there, but... Um, the ability to be able to kick, run and pass and I guess um, take make good decisions under pressure. Um, that's what I really like to see with them. And so um, they've got really good, you know, two good halfbacks in that, in that group. So um, you talk around competition, um, they can't afford to not have good games because you've got great competition in, in, those, in, in that team of French, of the French women, sorry. Well, it's not an amazing story that the two halfbacks are a couple. Can, can you imagine like TJ Pettinata and Aaron Smith competing for the same position? Imagine and the being competitive together? edge. <laughs> imagine the competitive edge. That'd yeah. be, They'll be competing who can dry the dishes as quick. <laughs> what a dynamic to be to go home with. Well, I'm just thinking of TJ, like everything's a competition with him, most halfbacks, but he is seriously, it would be, be an interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but on the other hand, imagine how much you get to hone the skills when you live with, mm. you know, you'd just be, well, I'd know Bryn, like halfbacks are sometimes the hardest working, they always last out on the training field. You'd be able to do it in the backyard, get even better. Passing down the hallway. <laughs> just passing down the hallway, just even the, the, the chats you can have as well. I think uh, even as a halfback group, there's so many conversations that you have, but, you know, if you're able to do that at home and even go out for dinner or a coffee, um, no wonder those two are playing, <laughs> playing good footy and why they're so good for France. Yeah, you and Drummy, you know, you probably missed a, a trick here. Oh, we have, mate. I would have loved to have dinner made by Drummy. So, um, yeah, I missed, I missed one here. Yeah. Drummy. <laughs> Drummy's with Drummy. <laughs> Over in a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, before we, we move on from the, uh, the World Cup, each week I think what we should do is a little power rankings based on the form of the weekend before. So, based on that, who do you see as the top four teams at this World Cup? Uh. England won. I think the Black Ferns will pip France for the, you know, sort of the comeback in the style. French third, fourth. It's probably between Wales and Canada. Mm. Maybe Canada. I don't know. It's a hard one. That fourth one. Wales should have run away with it, um, but obviously a less opp opposition for Canada. So 
I can't pick the fourth, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a right, five. That, that fence is, <laughs> fourth, yeah. fourth eagle. Yeah. <laughs> Bryn? No, I'll go Canada. Canada? I'll go Canada. He's in. Yeah, I think the top three um, speak for themselves. Whether you want to have France at two and have New Zealand at three, but I think with how the, the, the girls have been going and went on the weekend, you put them at two just in front of France. And then I guess their fourth position really um, is up for grabs. You can go Wales, um, go Canada. I liked what I saw in Italy. Whether you think they can do that again or um, can go to the later stage of the competition will be will be um, will be seen in the future. But um, for me, I'd have to go probably go Canada. I think that would be if I had to make a decision, I'd have to go Canada at four. Are we missing a beat? Like, a lot of roos are pretty strong as well. Mm. Like maybe they have to be considered like for. It's only one winner, one one team out of the pool though, isn't it? Uh. I think it's two win- two out of each pool, and then the next best qualifiers uh, yeah. go into a quarterfinal setup. Okay, yeah, maybe Aussie or there or thereabouts. If they can play that yes. brand and that, like they were so physical and played with such up tempo, um, you know that breakdown speed was just catching um, the Black Ferns offside or not allowing them to get dominant tackles. If they can sustain that, um, and, and let, we probably overlooked. The more I think about it, I feel like I'm going to put Aussie at four because the two yellow cars did change that game. There were a lot of points scored mm. in, in that period and it was right on the balance at that point and, and there was a lot of counteract tries. There was uh, nothing to... I'm not taking away from the Black Ferns, but there, were, there was clear defensive frailties with 13 on the field. I'm going to go Wallaroos 4. Wallaroos. I've yes. convinced myself. Yes, that was good. I've convinced myself. I enjoyed the thought process. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, amazing. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that on the weekend to see how the power rankings change, if they change next week. You know, I hope France tops England and really makes this an interesting competition. Would definitely, definitely turn on the head. Well, you know, I, we went for the obvious ones. Last week, well, I didn't. Obviously, I picked Northland and the NPC, but the the, <laughs> the Bop and, and Auckland uh, probably got the upset, so anything's possible. Mm, mm. They have plenty of chance in Canterbury, Bryn? Yeah, I think I've, I've changed my tune on that. I think uh, <laughs> for our Northland North viewers, I did think uh, Canterbury would win a little bit more easier. But look, it was a, um, a great game for the, for the Northland um, the Northern game against Canterbury. What a great season they've had. Uh, but no, I think they plenty do have a chance uh, against Canterbury. So uh, still hurting, still hurting after watching their Harbour game against Auckland. But um, congratulations to Auckland. 20, 2013 and Northland opted for the kick. What did you think then, Bryn? They obviously got to 2016, yeah. but I just, yeah, yeah I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I um, when watching that, I just thought, oh, there's, yeah, it's probably... Like it's not like it's within three points or or five or seven. It was four. You yeah. know what I mean? You know what I mean? 100%. So they had to score a try. And I think, and sometimes when you get in that position, you know, you might think it's penalty, and we can come back down here and score points. But for me, I just think it let let Canterbury off the hook. It gave Same. them an opportunity to, to reset. They came down, um, and then they were able to you know get a penalty with Fergus Burke and to to ice the game. And so um, yeah, for me personally, I think it was the wrong decision. And probably if they had their time again, thinking back on it. Um, they probably would have gone to the corner and tried to win the game. Um, yeah, win the game there. And I know they'd been bashing away before the half time break and and in the second half and hadn't got rewarded. Like I can see where their where their head was at in terms of can we pick up three. But my only concern, and, and this is what I thought at the time, was exiting. They hadn't done well all game, and Canterbury love putting pressure on that exit, mm. and it just played into their hands a little bit. They obviously got a penalty. They they got to kick to the corner and the mall was held up and turned over, but they eventually got um, what they came for. Um, I was also yeah. a little bit surprised Canterbury didn't take the three then, and and they went to the corner and they were held up. Um, but I suppose with a driving mall that's been as effective as... Uh, uh, I mean, they're just the best at closing, um, and I just think the better place to be is down your end when you're outside seven, you know Hawkins can kick from anywhere, so if you go, if you do score in the corner, it, it just you know sets it up for potentially a golden point. With the All Blacks 15 pack, you really should be able to do that. <laughs> should you should. <laughs> um, now, are you guys all right after the Auckland game versus Harbour? Oh, I'm not going to lie, it hurt. Yeah, it definitely hurt. Um, as soon as I saw Gats 
um, didn't come out at half time. Like he's just so he's in such a rich vein of form that he just knows when it needs to be, you know, where there's kick space and he can go long and he can put the ball in front of his feet. We just probably played a little bit too much out of our own end. Um, yeah, and, and just 15-6, yeah. put, put ourselves in a position, but um, I know I'm not supposed to say ourselves, but uh, uh, everyone knows I'd be lying if I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but you've got to credit Auckland. Um, they, they, they didn't play their best game, but they, they found the way to win. Um, and it wasn't made easy for them and, and potentially sets them up because Wellington didn't have it all their own way either. I think that semi-final, um, you know, will be will be real. I was obviously pumping Wellington up heavily last week, but um, Hawks Bay gave it to them and nearly stole it. Yeah. Really, probably could have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, to give everyone a bit of insight, yeah, thought, uh, like, go on, Brett. Yeah. No, I thought yeah, if just going on the back of Jeff for that Harbour game. Yeah, if there's one guy that I probably thought couldn't get injured, uh, you don't you don't want injured. Uh, it was Bryn, and it probably showed. In that last 40 minutes, you know, 15 to 6 going into half time, and you know, thinking the way that his form has been, the game management that he brings for that side, especially our forwards as well, because you know, when they brought all the, a lot of the All Blacks coming back and really struggled at scrum time, um, and then also line out as well, um, you know, the Auckland forwards really um, were able to get upper hand up there. But um, yeah, I think that if there's one guy that we probably couldn't afford to get injured, um, it was Bryn Gatlin on the weekend. So I'm not too sure what his injury is and whether that's going to. Um, have any say on his All Black 15, uh, but yeah, probably one of the get injured. And then, mm, yeah, I and then that, well, like you said, Jeff, um, Hawks Bay will probably be sitting a few beers now, uh, having their, their mad Monday, thinking they got they lost one there because they did that well to get back. You know, Wellington started very well and then should have actually won that game and stole it. But you know, to Wellington's credit, like Auckland, they didn't play their best footy in that in that parts of that game, but were able to find a way to win and to get to the semi final stages, which will be a cracking of a semi final against those two teams. Yeah, it will be. I think the other one's going to be a beauty too. Canterbury, Bay of Plenty. Like, probably glossed over Bay of Plenty's. Man, they were just ruthless in that period to run away from that. I know it you know, obviously scored 80 plus, which tightened it up, but Leroy Carter, how much, how, like the last two weeks, he has just destroyed um, defence of, of Waikato. So, um, you know, as long as he keeps his red hot form and, and Trask and Co can put the ball in the right spots. You know that pack's going to be up for it. There's a lot of, you know, Arkoy, Eklund. Um, there'll be a bit of gristle in there too because those two would, you know, would have been liking their chance for All Black 15. So plenty to prove, especially for Curdy, going up uh, against, you know, Brody and George Bell. Um, mm. he, and knowing his competitive edge, he will be through the roof mm. with excitement. OK, so what's the prediction then? Um, I'm <laughs> presuming Canterbury. <laughs> I'll go Bay of Plenty. Bay of Plenty, yes. I think it'll be a lot closer than what I predicted uh, last week, and even though it was closer than the Northern game. But um, I'll go Canterbury in a, in, a, in a tight game, though, very, very tight. I think what Bay Plenty can do, you know, they've got a they've got a great full pick that can do the hard work. They've got some great ball carriers in there, and they've also got an electric back line. You know, so the questions that they're going to be asking that Canterbury um, defence is going to be, I think, a little bit more than what um, the Northern team was. We talked a lot around North and how good they are defensively. But I think the Bay Plenty and what they can do on the attacking side will, um, will be tough for the Canterbury side. But I'll go Canterbury by two points, actually. Two points. Two points. Get to the tab. That's, that's what it's about. Mm. Um, and who do they play? Wellington or Auckland? I'll, I'll stick with Wellington. I, I, I just think they've probably... They, their form coming into the finals has got to, got to pay dividends for them. Um, but I, yeah, it's uh, Auckland have got enough talent to find a way to win as well. Uh, they showed that on the weekend. Like they can they can grind out a win, and they've also got enough X factor that can turn it on its head. Um, so it won't be easy. Uh, but I think the defensive effort that Richard Judd did on <laughs> Chase Tear Tear to stop um, Hawks Bay from scoring uh, in the corner and um, you know saving a certain potential match winner um, is, is, will be needed again this weekend. Do they have the All Blacks back, Chip? Do they still have Auckland have them in the team? Not sure. Don't know. Yeah. I think you, you, if, you're yeah. not going to remove um, any of the All Blacks 15 guys, so you'd have to think Paddy will definitely play. Mm. Um, it'll just be whether Akira plays or not. 
knowing a kidder he'll want to play because he wants to play every game. He even loves turning out for club footy if he can. Um, but it'll just be I don't know I don't know when they're travelling. Um, so yeah. Mm. You love these guys who love to turn up for club footy. I always oh. remember covering the Hurricanes and you'd have a chat with Andrew Hoare on a Monday and he'd taken off down and played for the uh, the Maggots yeah, down yeah. in the South Island on the weekend. And you're like, I don't know, that, that fits in your contract, mate. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works for you. Oh, and, yeah. be, and so he's just played a game, now he's played another game, now he's back at training and he's going again. I, I think it's like, especially Ponsonby, like Paddy always gets back there and plays. Um, Rico, any chance he gets, he'll go train there if he can't play. Um, I think it's really cool that connection that's still in our game and such a crucial part of our pathway as our clubs. Yes, yeah, right. And the grassroots stuff that's slightly below the NBC, the Heartland semis. Yeah. Um, you know, Wanganui weren't as clinical as they probably would have liked, but they've, they've got a home, home match against um, the, the Swamp Foxes, Thames Valley. Um, so you, you'd have to like, like them. And, and I think South Canterbury, um, they were massive in the Shield game against Hawke's Bay and really haven't dipped in that form the whole way. Um, so I think they'll probably win theirs more convincingly. Um, but uh, Wanganui at home will, will give them the edge and, and probably a little bit predictable. Those two sides ran, you know, the, Wanganui only lost once and that was against South Canterbury. Um, so I think it'll be a, a South Canterbury-Wanganui final. Um, and I, I do think Wanganui are going to have to be a lot more clinical. Um, they, they gave so many opportunities um, to mid-Canterbury. Um, Mid-Canterbury just weren't good enough to take them. I think if they give that many opportunities to Thames Valley, they'll, they'll be in trouble and, and potentially up for an upset. And the Law Cup? Good question. Um, that's a lot tighter. Like, there was, there was three, or four, um, three or four sides coming into that, but um, again, I think the, the home home advantage will, will come through. So that's North Otago and Horafanua Kapiti? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, against Mid Canterbury and East Coast. Yeah, well, East Coast have done well, um, but they, they are a much stronger force at home. Um, and Mid Canterbury, for the amount of opportunities they left out there, I just don't, I don't know if they've got that ability to turn that round in a week. Mm, mm. Oh, it would be interesting. I love a good weekend footy of, uh, of playoffs when you get to watch all afternoon and watch those Heartland games and it leads into the next one, especially on finals day when you see multiple trophies lifted over the course of the day. Yeah. It's, it's so much fun. It'll definitely um, be a big weekend. Yeah, yeah. I hope to see some people on horseback. That's always the best thing about watching a Heartland Championship <laughs> yeah. game. You might, watching the you game. might want East Coast, Coast to get to the final then. <laughs> Come on, the East Coast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, guys. Well, um, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. But before we go, uh, I might just have a quick chat to everybody about what the passing of Rugby Pass to World Rugby means to our podcast. We will carry on. Uh, the podcast is owned by Sky Sport and we'll continue to put it out through Rugby Pass's channels. So you don't need to go anywhere. You don't have to worry. We will continue to worry. <laughs> They're worrying about us. <laughs> if you're worrying about us. <laughs> it'll still be on YouTube. <laughs> don't. It'll still be on YouTube. You can still catch the audio pod, you know, and it'll still be on Sky Sports. So The comments really section will still be alive and well. Yeah, that's right. So you so can that, rip us to bits. It'll still be in there having a crack at you two. <laughs> it'll be epic, you know. We'll get some Rebels players in there, possibly some Tanifar players in there, and <laughs> anything that we can. Um, so, yeah, keep on tuning in. The Aotearoa Rugby Pod isn't going anywhere. Thanks once again for joining us. James Parsons in Auckland, Brent Hall in Japan. That's another one. We'll see you next week. Matewa.